Thank you, Brian. It's absolutely great to be here. And uh, let me begin by saying, by some strange, weird fluke, I, in fact, am a trombone player. <laughs> Not really. I played in high school, but that's the only instrument that I can play. Uh, so there's some sort of connection here. There's some kind of mystic connection because I played the trombone. Uh, I should just say that um, it's very important to know that municipality has a very important role in inclusionary housing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that role and I'm going to talk about some of the things that need to happen. But in response to the comments that uh, Remo put forward, the city does have a position on inclusionary housing. And in fact, that position has been put forward again and again. There is a council position on inclusionary zoning. We are a creature of the province, and we do not have the regulatory tools to implement it. And this is why MPP Milton's bill is so critical, because we need that bill to go forward, and then, trust me, we're all over this. We will be implementing this so quickly in this city, uh, it, it wouldn't be funny. It would be transformational. But we do not currently have the tools to do that. But that's a very important thing to know. We will, we will act as the implementer. There is strong political support. Obviously, there is a council position. That council position was reinforced very recently, again, in a uh, motion at PGM that, in fact, directed staff to begin figuring out how to implement inclusionary zoning, recognizing that uh, we are hopefully on the cusp of having that tool in our toolkit. I'd also like to stress a few of the other points that are, were made by my colleagues on the panel. One is that recognizing, and it's important to note, that inclusionary zoning uh, isn't social housing, doesn't replace social housing, but plays a critical role in addressing a gap that is only getting larger in the context of the city of Toronto as we see a great disparity between income levels and uh, housing prices in the city. And so inclusionary zoning is a way of ensuring that people can continue to live in the city. So I have some slides that I'm going to walk through that will pick up on some of those themes, but I thought I would say that by way of context. The very first and important thing to position this conversation in, and Remo spoke to this, which is the notion of complete communities. Creating communities that uh, have a variety of different housing types throughout our city, a variety of different tenures, there's rental and there's ownership, and is a place where people with a variety of different incomes can live, is a key part of creating a livable and sustainable city over the long term. And in fact, uh, the work we're doing in Regent Park is a great example of a modern initiative to move towards creating complete communities. But we actually have these communities all over the city already. If you look at a community like Young and Eglinton, uh, you have social housing, you have affordable rental, uh, and you have multi-million dollar homes all living cheek and jowl, using the same infrastructure in the parks and sharing amenities. And that's a critical part of creating a complete community in our city. We have an opportunity through infill, as well as larger scale transformation. And the image you see here is from the Lawrence Allen secondary plan. But we have an opportunity in both of those instances to be adding a variety of different housing types. And a key part of the objective in complete communities, your mind might not go straight here, but a key objective is really around traffic congestion. It's about creating a livable city where we have a variety of movement options, where it's possible to live close to where you work, possible to do a whole variety of things within walking distance or a short cycle from home. That's what commu Complete Communities is really all about at its core, and it really is at its core about livability. Now, if we look at our official plan vision, uh, this is a slide that I show again and again many, many times over the course of the year when I present our larger vision for the type of city that we're seeking to create. And I present this slide because a critical part of our vision in our official plan, which is the key regulatory document that governs how we function in the city of Toronto, is supporting and creating policy support for affordable housing in the city. Now, we have policies that recognize the importance of protecting our existing rental stock, 
particularly in a high growth environment. That's a critical, critical part of the story. But we also have policies that are around finding new ways to be providing housing affordability. And inclusionary zoning is recognized as one of those key policy tools that has worked very well in comparable cities elsewhere. To go to some of the examples that were cited uh, from American cities, Chicago, large cities like Denver, San Diego, New York, there's places where these policies have been used and they've been very, very effective. And we recognize that the city of Toronto is in that very unique situation where we're growing so rapidly that it's inevitable that uh, a good portion of the population is increasingly going to be priced out of the market. Now, the image you he see here is 60 Richmond Street East, East, which is a TCHC building with a total of 85 units. The building contains a combination of one to four bedroom units, and 59 of them are designated as Regent Park replacement housing, and the remainder are affordable rental. This is uh, an example of some of the affordable housing that has been built in, in the city recently. Now, let's talk a little bit about need for inclusionary housing. Part of the challenge here is we're growing rapidly. As we grow rapidly, the city becomes more and more desirable. Land prices and therefore housing prices continue to accelerate. This is the burden and the beast. This is the, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times story. This is the three cities that we see in David Halchensky's work. And in fact, it's the reason why we need to use policy tools to mitigate some of the negative implications of growing very rapidly as a city. A little bit about some of the rising housing costs in the city. Over the past 10 years, the average resale price of ownership housing has increased 87% in the city, with a price for a single detached house now over a million dollars in the city. The average price for a resale home in the city is $635,000, leaving only those in the top 20% of household incomes able uh, to buy. So this creates a real challenge for us as a city. How do we increase housing affordability and if we can link that housing affordability to the rapid growth that we see in the city, we in fact create a win-win situation. So that's the opportunity with inclusionary housing. Uh, we also know that the government has backed away from being directly involved in affordable housing. We know that wonderful neighborhoods like St. Lawrence uh, neighborhood, that we simply do not have policy programs that existed in the 70s to build, to recreate those wonderful models that have in fact stood the test of time. But those policy frameworks have disappeared. And as a result, we need new policy that is in fact going to be effective <coughs> at delivering and responding to the very real need for affordable housing. And we also know uh, that the private market cannot meet the need uh, and will not meet the need. And it's interesting because Mayor Bloomberg at the beginning of his term did talk about, well, let's just build lots of supply and demand, right? Let's just build lots, lots, lots and lots more housing and housing will become less expensive. Well, there's one missing piece to that, which is not if demand is continuing to increase. And in a global economy where uh, hundreds of thousands of people are moving into cities and moving into our city from all over the world, simply building more housing, in fact, isn't going to be a real response. And that 87% increase that we've seen over the course of the past decade, a decade where we've been adding significantly to our housing stock, demonstrates that the private market is not going to meet the demand for affordable housing. And this is why we need strong and clear policy tools that will begin to mitigate some of the implications that we see. It's important to note that almost half of the households in the city of Toronto are rentals, and yet rental housing in the city has barely increased over the course of the past two decades. Uh, 90 to 95 percent of all new housing in the last two decades has been in the ownership market. Now, we are beginning to see a little bit of a shift. We have proposals coming forward that are for purpose-built rental buildings. We also know that some of the uh, condo stock has been acting as a de facto rental market in the city as well, but this doesn't address the affordability challenge and the affordability uh, gap. The average rent for a two-bedroom condo is $1,895 uh, versus $1,264 for a purpose 
built rental apartment. So what we're seeing in terms of the way the condo is filling in the gaps for the rental market, it's doing a great job, but it's not doing it at an affordable level. And this is why we need policies that very clearly speak to securing affordable rental and affordable ownership in the city. Uh, now the image you see here is the Berwick, uh, Young and Eglinton. This is a new condo development that includes 12 rental replacement units and 225 condo, condo uh, units. Um, getting the rental replacement into the building was a success. Uh, however, this was replaced and was lost and we didn't in fact, these were replacement we didn't add any new rental buildings. And you know, it's interesting because when you see these numbers, um, it's like a little, you know, we, a, 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 a good thing is happening in that we are ensuring we're not losing <coughs> rental in the city, uh, but we've really struggled to increase the rental supply. And as I mentioned earlier, I do think we're on the cusp of seeing some significant change in that area. So it stands that affordability, this is it, affordability is a, key issue. There's no doubt about, about that. Uh, that's why we are here having this conversation today. Um, approximately 150,000 households in the City of Toronto are not in suitable housing, meaning it's not the appropriate housing form for the need. For example, there aren't enough bedrooms for the number of people in the household. And this is a very important part of the story in the city, uh, and it's difficult to understand, it's difficult to quantify, but appropriate and secure housing is a critical part of what we're trying to figure out in creating these new mechanisms to address affordable housing. 35% um, of all households spend more than 30% of their income on housing. In the core, where we have seen overwhelming growth, 42% of households spend more than 30% on housing and 70% in the core, 70% are in fact renters. And we've in fact been working really hard to try and get more three bedroom units into our condos so that there are condos for families. Uh, I've had some interesting tours of some condo buildings that have recently been built with developers and discovered that an interesting thing is happening. Uh, families are not moving into those three bedroom units. Uh, they're typically filling up with sometimes uh, students sometimes uh, echo boomers who are working downtown, but often a three bedroom unit will have five or six or a multiple number of people who are sharing rooms and bunking up and sharing space in order to afford the, <coughs> afford the housing. So there's a variety of different things and a variety of different housing types that will take place in our market and the critical critical question here is how we can put policies in place that do in fact drive to the affordability piece. Now, uh, the City of Toronto uh, has a plan, uh, uh, housing opportunities, uh, and this affordable housing framework sets out a target of 10,000 new affordable rental units and 2,000 affordable ownership units from uh, 2010 to 2020. To date, we have seen 2,792, so that's about 20% of the target has been achieved for affordable rental and 750 or 37% of the target for affordable ownership. But it's important to note, to get to the point that Richard made, all of those units relied on government funding. And they're constrained by limits in government funding. Inclusionary housing, inclusionary zoning uh, is based on a requirement that doesn't rely on government funding, and that's the reason why we could in fact uh, expedite adding more affordable housing into the market by using this regulatory tool. Uh, we could in fact, uh, if it, just to give you a little case study, what if, given this boom that we've just seen, the city required 10% of new units to be affordable in developments, let's say with over 300 units, so really large unit, really large developments, over 300 units. 10% need to be affordable. Uh, if in fact we had inclusionary zoning in place over the past five years and we had that policy in place for you know, developments over uh, 300 units, we would have secured 12,000 affordable housing units in the past five years alone. That would have an impact. 
that would have a real impact on access to housing in this city. So let me take my last minute uh, just to tell you a little bit about some of the implementation challenges and opportunities from our perspective. Um, the first one is that we feel very strongly that inclusionary zoning policies would need to be applied across the entire city of Toronto. And that's in part because we want to take away the, the uh, land speculation implication and we want the regulation to simply result in an adjustment in land values across the entire city. We feel very strongly that inclusionary housing uh, must be outside of the Section 37 negotiation because right now Section 37, which is a section of the Planning Act where we negotiate the uh, community benefits is done based on the scale of the development and the impact the development is going to have in the community once we've achieved good, good planning. So that means that it's a negotiation and it's different every time. And sometimes you've got a great negotiator, sometimes not so great a, a negotiator, depends on how the counselor gets involved in time. So we get, we get different outcomes on different projects. That's not a terrible thing. But it would be a terrible thing for inclusionary zoning because it would lead to a lot of uncertainty and it would likely mean we would secure a lot less than if we had a formula across the entire city. So some of the challenges we need to figure out, should it apply to new developments over 50 units or 100 units or 300 units? What should that threshold be? Uh, what is the right percentage of affordable housing to require in a unit to ensure that the market viability of the project isn't impacted? Uh, should it be in all of areas of the city that we require it, or should we require it in just some areas of the city? Uh, how do we ensure we see both new affordable rental as well as new affordable ownership secured? These are some of the questions that we have to figure out in moving forward in implementing this in the city. You see here an image of Albert Gardens, which is a uh, TCHC social housing replacement building that's been built uh, in, in North York that includes uh, market units, rent geared to income units, and rent geared to income units that are refurbished. Um, we've been asked many times, as I said at the outset, over the past decade, uh, and we've written many letters to the province requesting permission to use inclusionary zoning at the city uh, level. And in fact, in the context of the re review of bill, uh, a, a proposed amendments to Bill 73, we put a formal recommendation once again to the province uh, advocating for how important this is in the City of Toronto. We're currently looking at ways to leverage our city plans, official plan policies to require and encourage new affordable housing units as community benefits. And we've done this in a variety of different instances in the city. Uh, we have six units here, five units there. We have used Section 37 to negotiate benefits. But to be fair, it's being done on a very, very, very small scale. We're also bringing forward a new definition of affordable ownership uh, recently. And the changes are really important because we need to ensure that the definition of housing affordability is consistent with the current housing market. And as you can appreciate, even across the city of Toronto, there's going to be variances because <coughs> house prices vary across the city. But our objective is to ensure that we have clarity about that definition of housing affordability because the entire inclusionary zoning framework is in fact going to hang on that definition. That's what we're going to be seeking to achieve. We've already made policy changes to allow for condominium rental units in new developments as a Section 37 benefit. We had been doing this as a one-off, but we essentially cleaned up the policy framework got rid of some of the red tape. So now it is very easy to secure on a large scale development uh, if we have an amenable developer and this is a desired community amenity in the area, we can get six or 10 or 15 affordable housing units in any given development. We are achieving new affordable housing on our large sites and in some of our secondary plans, such as the waterfront, Downsview uh, at York University, using our official plan policies and Section 37. We're going to keep moving that forward. And as these new communities, the three I've just mentioned, are built out, built out, we'll see close to uh, uh, 1,500 new affordable uh, units over the next five to 15 years being built in the city. So the up uptick is increasing. It's already increasing using some of the other tools that we already have. I just want to uh, thank you, Brian, for the invitation to be here. This is a, a critical, important conversation, and I've learned a lot already. Thank you.
Thank you.